Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and we are going to do some quantum mechanics today, which is going to be great. Okay, so here we go. That is, of course, only if I can get the cap off of the marker off. <laughs> okay, quantum mechanics. In terms of thinking about quantum mechanics, right, we have kind of two major pieces that we regu regularly think about. The first major piece um, is quantum numbers. And within quantum numbers, that encapsulates things like what the models looked like, so on and so forth. And then we have on the other side these electron configurations, which intend to kind of tell me where electrons are for certain elements. And I can do that in a way that tells me a couple of the quantum numbers or all four quantum numbers. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick moment on what the quantum numbers can be, and then we're going to talk about what that looks like in the context of shape, size, so on and so forth of orbitals. Okay, so in terms of this, let's talk about, let's make ourselves kind of a chart of what's going on. Let's say we got the quantum number, and this is assuming you've had you have a sense of, or have read something about what these quantum numbers are, okay? Um, what the N, or actually not the N, what the letter is that describes them, right? So what letter best describes these quantum numbers, or how do we abbreviate it, okay? The numbers that are allowed for these quantum numbers, and um, let's talk about uh, the description. What does what does that certain quantum number describe? And then maybe we'll do some extra info. Okay, so in terms of these, right, we're going to have four quantum numbers that we're going to want to talk about. Okay, let's fill this in with a different color. All right, let's start with the beginning. The beginning, you have at the beginning you have the principal quantum number. The, and that's the first number that comes out of the Schrodinger equation. Remember the Schrodinger equation is h psi equals e psi. Basically what this is, is h is an operator. So it's called the Hamiltonian operator. That's why it's abbreviated h. And it's um, operating on a wave function. That's what psi is, okay? And when it operates on that wave function, then we get energies out of that. That's what e is. And we get the wave function back, okay? So the first number we get out of this particular um, equation is actually, and we'll put maybe one here so that you know it's the first, is the principal quantum number, okay? It's abbreviated by the letter N. The numbers that can be allowed for this particular number is N can be a whole positive integer between one and infinity. Woo! We don't go to infinity, by the way. There's no way you'll ever find infinity on this. But, you know, that's what the numbers can be. All right, so description. This describes the size and energy of an orbital. What an orbital is, by the way, is I have Schrodinger here. I'm going to talk about an orbital. The orbital is basically a 3D volume in which electrons exist. Okay, it's actually a 3D probability volume. Um, what we do is we uh, kind of give this idea based off of the Schrodinger equation and based off of a 95% probability we can make mathematically areas, not areas, sorry, volumes, 
in which, so it's three dimensional, right? So that those electrons exist somewhere within that space with, some, with basically a 95% certainty. That's more or less what we're talking about. Sometimes orbitals, uh, the overlapping space of orbitals is called as a whole electron density. So if you've ever heard this word of electron density, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so that's the overlapping orbitals once you have them all together for the, uh, around the nucleus for each atom. Okay, so this is the size and energy of an orbital. The extra info here, maybe we'll get to this in a minute. Um, this does correlate to the Bohr model. So in Bohr's model, this was equal to the shells. So making a, a departure between Schrodinger, which is the modern, modern model that we use today, we treat electrons as waves, versus Bohr, who treated electrons as particles, and did the planetary model, where, which looks kind of like a dartboard. This was uh, equivalent to his shells, his numbered um, orbits, orbits, not orbitals, that were around the nucleus. Okay? There are some things that we can know, right? So. Um, in a given n, we could, we could talk about many things in terms of in a given n. All right, so in a given n, there are two n squared electrons. Maybe we'll start there, okay? So what we're going to find is each orbital that I can talk about can contain up to two electrons. And we'll discuss that more as we get to the place of actually describing these 3D volumes. All right, so this the next quantum number, we'll just call the secondary quantum number. Okay, one of these, it's either, sometimes I've seen this both ways. We'll describe this with L. Sometimes this one is called the azimuthal quantum number, and sometimes the M sub L, which we'll get to next, is called the azimuthal quantum number. What that basically means is azimuthal is a way of describing 3D space and geometry. So both of those kind of fit, just FYI. So depending on the book, you might see either. Um, OK, what can L exist as? L exists as a set, so I'm going to do some set notation here. Um, and the set is between 0 and n minus 1. So when I draw it like that, what I mean is when I say that L can exist between 0 and n minus 1, what I mean is that L can be any number between, or any whole positive integer, let's say it that way, any whole... I'll just say whole integer because zero could be debated as to whether it's positive or negative. Any whole integer between zero and n minus one. Okay? So that's just what that's talking about. Okay? And you need to know how to predict what, are what numbers are allowed for each of these. In terms of this description, this describes the shape of an orbital. Perhaps I should put n here an orbital. Okay, so we have some things that we can talk about here. In a given n, so if I describe what n is, like if I say n is equal to 1, then there are n number of L's, right? So there's n number of shapes, and I can also say something else. This corresponds in Bohr's model to the subshells. And if you recall, the subshells were given letters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to correlate when L equals some number, for instance, when L equals 0, we're going to call that an S. Okay? When L is equal to 1, we're going to call that P. When L is equal to 2, we'll call that D. When L is equal to 3, we're going to call that F. Okay? And this is going to be the shape. So for instance, S. If I talked about S for a moment here, S is a sphere, which I'm going to draw a horrible sphere. Your book does such a better job of talking about a sphere. The nucleus is right there in the middle, right? And this sphere, if I had a 1S, 1 is talking about the N. That's, given, that's giving the principal quantum number. S is talking about the shape, 
Okay, so in terms of this, 1s is going to be smaller than, for instance, 2s, which I might or might not have room to do. You're going to only see part of it, maybe, and that's a horrible sphere, but you're going to give me, cut me some slack for not having a great circle moment here. So 2s is going to be bigger, right, because n describes the size, and it's going to have higher energy because n, again, describes the energy. But they're both spheres. That's what the L is telling you. Okay? So in your book, you'll have pictures of S as a sphere, P as a peanut. Um, basically, uh, I think of it as a peanut. Not everyone does, but that's what it is. D is a daisy. It looks kind of like, although, forgive me, physical chemists, I apologize in advance. I think D looks a little like overlapping peas. I know that's not the way you guys think about it, but that's what we're, I, you know, the daisy comes from that. And then F is kind of a flower, okay? So that's where that is, okay? So L, the secondary quantum number. Let's talk about the third number that comes out of the Schrodinger equation. We'll call that the tertiary quantum number. It has all kinds of names, but we're just gonna go with tertiary. Again, secondary and tertiary can be called azimuthal. There are several other names that we've assigned at times to these, um, but we're just going to call it tertiary. M sub L is the way I'm going to show that as a letter. And what M sub L is, is it's a set. I'm going to do some set notation on this as well. It can be any number between positive L and negative L. So I'm going to do negative L first. So negative L and positive L. And where, what does this really talk about? It talks about the orientation in three dimensions of an orbital. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, so if I actually put some axes on this, right, so I had a little bit of, I'll do it on my 1s here. All right, so here's my y, maybe my x, and my z, right? Okay, so no matter how you orient a sphere, so basically the idea here is the orientation of a sphere is either, you can either think of it as one orientation, which encompasses all the orientations that could have, because no matter how you turn it, it always looks the same, or you could say it has infinite orientations, you just can't tell which one is which. Okay, we're gonna go with the one, right? So, in terms of that, no matter how you turn a sphere, it always looks like a sphere. However, if you do the peanut deal, so let's do a little quick moment on this. There's x, y, and z. Let's do it this way. Then if you look at the peanut, here's the nucleus of the atom, and this is gonna be horrible. You're gonna forgive me for that. That's what the peanut looks like, okay? It can be oriented along the y-axis, or it could be oriented along the x-axis, or it could be oriented along the z-axis. And each of those is a different orientation. So this is describing the orientation of the peanut along the different axes. The p orbitals have three orientation, one along each of the axes. D has five orientations, F has seven orientations. So that's kind of the sense of what we're talking about. It does not have uh, corollary in Bohr's model because Bohr's model was flat. Bohr lived in a world that was flat, <laughs> apparently, in terms of his model. Um, and while the planets are not flat, that's how they can be thought about in a, in a two-dimensional world. And so, indeed, once Heisenberg proved, or at least supposed, and everyone thought that was fabulous, um, that you could not treat electrons the same way you treated planets, then the piece here is that we had to bust into three dimensions. And when we busted into three dimensions, Bohr's model suddenly became less important. Okay, so it has, Bohr's model has corollaries in the principal quantum number and the secondary quantum number, but does not in the tertiary quantum number. In terms of this, I can say in a given n, there are um, n squared m sub l's. Okay, so sometimes 
we use m sub l to describe, or the tertiary quantum number, to describe orbitals. We talk about orbitals as if they're only m sub l's. That is absolutely not true. To describe this 3D space, I need not only what its shape is, I need to know that it's a P, I need to know how big it is, what its N is, um, and then I also need to know what its orientation is. It actually takes all three of the first quantum numbers to be able to describe this three-dimensional space. So while we refer to M sub L's as if they're orbitals, they aren't really. But what we can say is we can say that there are two electrons in each orbital described by N, L, and M sub L, right? So we can say there are two electrons in each of these three-dimensional spaces we're talking about. Okay, having said all of this, which this is kind of a, a beginning description, um, the really interesting piece of this is that these three quantum numbers are the only three that come out of the Schrodinger equation. That describes pretty fully the three-dimensional spaces we're looking at. So what is the fourth quantum number about? Well, this one is not even called the fourth quantum number. It's called the spin quantum number. And it's designated as M sub s. And what is happening here, and this is also a possibility of a set, M sub s could either be positive one-half or negative one-half. And what is this describing? It's describing the spin of the electrons in an orbital. OK. Here's the thing, guys. The idea here is that you've described the space in which two electrons exist. That's fabulous. You did a fabulous job of doing that. However, Two electrons, two minuses, have to exist in the same space. And that doesn't make a huge amount of sense, right? That's two minuses in space want to be as far away from each other as possible. How in the world would they exist in the same volume? Well, here's the, here's the reason why we think that that's possible. Okay, so in other words, what the idea here was that basically there was a proposal that if you had an electron, it could either spin clockwise or counterclockwise. And depending on how you designate it, what I'm going to look at is in each orbital, I'm going to have one spinning clockwise and the other spinning counterclockwise. Ooh, ooh, go the opposite way. And these two electrons, if this is electron one and electron two, these two electrons can exist in space because basically when one spins clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on how you want to do this, let's say the clockwise gets the or orientation up, then basically what this is saying is that it orients its negative upward, which gives me the idea of kind of an arrow with a half which we'll see in chapter eight, okay? That is talking about its spin is orienting its negative upward, okay? The op one spinning the opposite direction is gonna orient its negative the opposite direction, downward. And we designate this as spin down. And you have kind of a half arrow to tell you that. Okay, the random assignment here, which there's some logic as to how it's assigned, we don't really care. Okay, I'm sorry. Again, I apologize to the physical chemists out there. But spin down, we're going to label as minus one half. And spin up, we're going to label as plus one half. Okay, and basically what this is meaning to say is it's meaning to say, hey, two minuses can exist in the same space because one basically orients its spin in one direction and the other one orients its spin in the opposite direction and their negatives don't ever really see each other. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so that's how they can both exist in the same space. And those are the four quantum numbers. All right, until next time, I bid you adieu.